The People of Sparks, sequel to The City of Ember, written by Jeannie Duprow. Chapter 13, Taking Action. One evening, Dune wandered off by himself toward the far corner of the hotel, where the trees grew thickly and the undergrowth beneath them was dense. He made his way into the woods, to a thicket of vines all woven together like thorny ropes. Little lumpy fruits, some red and some black, grew on these vines. Dune had already discovered that the red ones were hard and sour, but if left to ripen, they turned black and sweet. He had been checking the vines regularly. Each day there were more and more of the black ones. Today, he saw, there were more blackberries than red. He began picking them. Some he ate right off the vine. They were sweet and juicy. Others he put in a basket he'd brought with him to take them back to the others in room 215. He heard footsteps behind him. A voice, he recognized it instantly, called out, Dune! He turned around, and there was Tick striding toward him, smiling his dazzling smile. Dune stood up. He'd been squatting to reach for the berries in the lowest vines. Look what I found, he said, holding out a handful of berries to Tick. Tick took one and popped it into his mouth. His eyebrows shot up in surprise. Terrific, he said. He took the rest of them from Dune's palm. So, he said, are you going to save us again? Save us, said Dune, confused. Yes, from starvation. You're the hero of Ember. It's about time for you to save us again. It flustered Dune to be called a hero. He wasn't sure if Tick was admiring him or making fun of him. He couldn't think what to say next. Tick reached into the thicket and plucked a few berries for himself. These are good, he said. Mind if I take some? They don't belong to me, said Dune. Anyone can have them. Tick hunted among the vines for a while, picking berries and popping them into his mouth. Then he said, You know that building they call the Ark? Dune nodded. Ever been in it? No, said Dune. Just in the separate room at the back. They have books there. You should see them. There must be thousands. Tick didn't comment on the books. I went in there the other day, he said. They had me carry in a crate of pickled beets. It's their storehouse, you know. They say they're short of food. Ha! Huh. Tick gave a laugh that was more like a bark. That place is full of food. Really? said Dune. Really? said Tick, tossing three berries into his mouth. There's jars of preserved fruit and sacks of dried fruit and every kind of pickle and bags of corn loads and loads of food and we get limp carrots for our dinner i believe there's a bit of stinginess going on dune frowned he thought of his father looking with dismay last night at the scanty contents of his dinner parcel he thought about what ordney had said at lunch the week before we just don't have enough for 400 extra people was this untrue after all tick had moved a few steps away and found a patch that was thick with berries he was picking them rapidly, eating each one. When he spoke, his words sounded a little juicy. I don't know about you, he said, but I don't like unfairness. I don't either, said Dune. He walked over to Tick and offered him a handful of berries he just collected. Tick took them all. I believe an unfair situation needs to be corrected, Tick said. Corrected how? Tick wiped his red-stained fingers on his pants. Well, he said, that's something we have to figure out. We, thought Dune. He liked that. Though he'd stopped taking part so often in Tick's projects, still he admired Tick's energy and felt his power. He was glad Tick had sought him out. He was glad that Tick seemed to consider him different from the others, smarter, more important. You're right, he said. We should do something. Tick nodded. I don't trust these Sparks people, he said. In some ways, they seem very primitive. Do you know that they make fire by hitting two stones together? They do? Dune hadn't seen anyone starting a fire since he was rarely in the kitchens. He knew that the fire in the bakery was kept going all the time. He'd seen people going in there sometimes carrying candles that had gone out. They don't have matches, he said. Sometimes they do, said Tick, but not always. Matches seem to be rare. We should give them some of ours, said Dune. All the people who'd come out of Ember had the matches that they were supplied with in the boats. The Emberites had hundreds of matches. Oh, I don't think so, Tick said quickly. We need them. We have to keep those for ourselves. 
June wondered why, when they had so many. But he thought maybe matches figured somehow in Tick's plans. So you're with me, said Tick. Sure, said June. Then he hesitated. With you in what? Action, said Tick. You took action before when there was an urgent situation. We may need to take action again pretty soon. Dune still didn't know what Tick had in mind, but he asked no more questions. Tick had a way of letting you know that he'd given all the answers he was going to give. All right, Dune said. I'm with you. Good, said Tick. He held out his hand and Dune shook it. Tick grinned and walked away. Dune watched him lope across a field. For a moment, he was lost in his thoughts. Food in the storehouse. Stinginess. Unfairness. Figure something out. You're with me. When he came to himself again and glanced down at his hands, he was startled to see them streaked with blood. Had he scratched himself on the thorns of the vines? It took him a second to realize that what looked like blood was only berry juice, passed to his hand from ticks. Lena made a plan. She'd hide among the boxes and crates on Casper's truck, and she would ride that way to the city. It was only a day's journey away. Surely she'd be able to find a way back. There must be other roamers on the roads. But of course she could just ask Casper if she could go with him, but she was sure he'd say no. He was on some kind of important business. He wouldn't want to be bothered with her. It was best to go secretly. Once she had seen the city, she would know if it was the place where the people of Ember were destined to live. She was sure she'd know it as soon as she saw it. Then she could hop out of the truck and find her way back. Casper might never see her at all. The next day, she tore part of a blank page out of one of the doctor's books and wrote this note. Dear Mrs. M, I have gone with Casper and Maddie on the truck. I will be back in two days or maybe three. There is something important I want to find out. Also, I need a change from here. See you soon. Love, Lena. Her plan was to wait until that night when Mrs. Murdo was asleep and tuck the note between the pages of the ancient crumbling book she had been reading. Something called Charlotte's Web. She kept urging Lena to look at it, but Lena said she wasn't that interested in spiders. It would be better for Dune. Mrs. Murdo read only in the evening, so Lena would have at least a day's head start before anyone knew where she was. A few doubts about her plan lurked in the back of Lena's mind. She knew Mrs. Murdo would worry about her. Poppy would miss her. And Lena didn't like Casper or trust him, and she knew that he and Maddie would probably be angry if they found that she had come along. It was a bit of a risky journey she was embarking on. But anything truly important involved risks, didn't it? She had taken a huge risk before in the last days of Ember, and it had been the right thing to do. So probably this was the right thing, too. She was so sure the city was their destination, and she was so determined to see the city for herself that she turned her mind away from her doubts. It would be an adventure, she told herself. She would be fine. She got up before the sun the next morning. She crept out of her bed on the floor, one tiny motion at a time. Poppy didn't stir, nor did Mrs. Murdo in her bed on the couch. In the half-darkness, Lena put her clothes on and pulled the pillowcase bag she'd packed the night before from its hiding place in the window seat. She tucked her note between the pages of Mrs. Murdo's book. Then, carrying her bag, she opened the door so softly it made no noise and went out into the courtyard. Just beyond the gate, the truck was standing ready. The oxen weren't attached to it yet. They were down the road at the barn to be brought later by the stable hand. Lena climbed onto the back of the truck. Its metal bottom was gritty with dust and bits of dry grass. It was loaded with four large barrels, two bicycles strapped together, a box full of tubs and buckets, and four big wooden crates made of slats of wood spaced about an inch apart. The crates were taller than Lena and about four feet square, like small rooms almost. Three of them were full of goods to be sold, but the fourth was empty. Its contents had been sold in sparks. That one would be Lena's hiding place. Getting into it was easy. First, she tossed her bag over the side. Then she climbed up the slats as if it were a ladder and jumped down in. The wood was rough and splintery, but she had prepared for that. She'd brought a small blanket from her bed. She spread this on the bottom of the crate and lay down on it, using her bag of supplies as a pillow. She was sure that if she lay very still, no one would see her. And she was right. An hour or so later, she didn't know for sure how long, but the sun was now shining through the slats in the crate, 
and she could feel its warmth on her back. She heard the clatter of the gate latch and voices. Torrens first. But I'd be helpful, he said in a tearful, desperate wail. I would. I know how to tie knots, and I can... Now that's enough, said Casper. You're not coming with us. Get it through your hard little head. You're not old enough. Roaming is a dangerous business. It's not for children. She gets to go, Torin said. Of course. She's not a child. She's my partner. Lena felt a jolt as the box holding Casper and Maddie's belongings was heaved up onto the truck. Here comes Joe with the oxen, right on time, said Casper. The truck squealed and trembled as the oxen were hitched to it. Lena heard the gate latch clatter again, and then the doctor's voice. When will you be back this way? Not for a while. The truck slanted as Casper got on. Several months is my guess. We've got a big route planned out. You should be taking me, cried Torin. You'll be sorry you didn't. I'll tell on you. I'll tell Uncle. Casper chuckled. Uncle would not be interested, he said. He's much too busy. Always has been. There was a crack of a whip. Goodbye, little brother, Casper called, and the truck jolted forward.